in the course of my work, uh, especially in preaching and uh, giving retreats, the question I probably hear most often from people is, what is God up to? What does God want? Often people will say to me they, they envy biblical characters, you know, from David to Jacob to Abraham, who seem to receive these direct communications from God. God tells them what he wants. And I remind them that even in the Bible, those figures wrestle rather mightily with the question anyway. And then typically I direct their attention to the figure of Job. There's no figure in the Bible who struggles more, uh, struggles with greater anxiety with this question of what is God doing? What's God up to? Well, just recently, uh, the Coen brothers, who I think are among the best filmmakers on the scene today, uh, they made Fargo, which I think is a masterpiece, one of my favorite movies. They just come out with a movie called A Serious Man. And A Serious Man is basically a modern uh, retelling of the book of Job. The hero is a fellow named um, Lawrence Gopnik. He's a mild-mannered Jewish uh, professor of physics at a small college in 1960s era Minnesota. Uh, nothing too impressive about Larry, as he's called in the movie. Uh, in fact, he corresponds pretty closely to the stereotype of the Schlemiel. And his uh, supporting cast is a pretty desultory group, too. He's got a henpecking wife. He's got a pair of kind of self-absorbed, obnoxious uh, teenage kids. His brother is living with him. His brother is kind of a loser, doesn't have a job. And he spends uh, most of his days and nights uh, draining a boil on the back of his neck. And the movie sort of focuses uh, in on that. Um, and then we see now, as the film unfolds, it's just a series of great uh, disasters befalling Larry. His wife uh, frankly tells him she's in love with another man, she wants a divorce. Then the dean of his uh, department tells him that his tenure application is in doubt. We hear that he's being threatened with a lawsuit by one of his students' uh, fathers. And then his poor brother is accused of uh, illegal gambling and sodomy. It's as though the, the whole world has fallen down all at once on poor Larry Gopnik, our 20th century Job. Well, at this point, he turns to his Jewish faith. And this is where the movie gets, I think, very interesting theologically. Because no one in the movie disbelieves in God. It's not a question of, of is there a God or not. But they're trying to discern what does God want? What is God doing? Here's Larry, who's a pretty upright fellow. But yet his whole world has fallen in on him. So what is God doing? The great question. Well, he goes to a series of rabbis to find out. He makes an appointment with his rabbi, and it turns out that his rabbi's uh, away, and his place is taken by this very young kid, just out of uh, rabbi school. And there he is, and, and Larry uh, poses the question, and the young man gives a kind of superficial, uh, relatively trite answer about seeing God in all things, changing your attitude so that you can, you can see God. He opens the blinds, and he shows them the parking lot, the very ordinary parking lot, and says, with great effervescence, well, God is, is even in a place like that. So Larry is, is still unsatisfied. He goes to a second rabbi, and the second rabbi tells him this very strange story about a, a congregate of his, a Jewish dentist, who discovers on the inside of the, of the, or the back of, of his, one of his patient's teeth, perfectly formed Hebrew letters. And the man knew nothing about it, didn't put them there. They're just there on the back of his teeth. And they spell out, help me, save me. Well, it threw the dentist into a kind of tizzy. I mean, how could this be? How did this happen? And it sends him on a, a spiritual quest. But it seems as though God has rather miraculously revealed himself in this strange event. Well, Larry hears that story, but still is not satisfied that he knows what God is about. He goes to a third rabbi, very old man, the most respected figure in the community, this ancient, uh, wise man, rabbi. And he waits there, and the secretary goes to announce his presence to the rabbi. She comes back very slowly and then just says, he's busy. <laughs> so the rabbi won't see him. Now, the three rabbis probably correspond in the Cohen's uh, movie to the three friends in the book of Job. After all these terrible struggles um, fall on Job, he seeks uh, counsel from these three friends who give him relatively unsatisfactory answers. Well, then the answer, though, I think does come, but in a very surprising way. We heard throughout the movie about his son, Danny, 
Larry's son Danny is a 13-year-old who's preparing for his bar mitzvah. So we see him there in Hebrew class, very boring, and he's listening to the, uh, the rabbi kind of drone on about Hebrew. And he's listening to his little transistor radio from the 1960s with a little earpiece. And the song on the transistor radio is the old um, Jefferson Airplane song, Somebody to Love. i got to find somebody to love. So we hear him listening to that. The rabbi comes by, he, he catches him, he confiscates the uh, radio, and it eventually finds its way to this ancient rabbi, this old wise figure. So Danny is eventually bar mitzvahed. He gets through the ceremony, and then he's ushered into the presence of this great, this great respected rabbi who will give him, we presume, a word of wisdom. He makes his way slowly to the desk. He's in this great office of the rabbi. The rabbi has this beautiful white beard. You know, he's, a, he's an archetype of Jewish wisdom. And then we hear coming from his, his bearded you know, face the words of the Jefferson Airplane. <laughs> so he says, um, when you discover the truth to be lies and all the joy within you dies, you better find somebody to love. And so he'd been listening, obviously, to the song, but now coming out of this rabbinic face, it's obviously a sort of revelation of very profound wisdom. Then the movie ends with a great tornado approaching the school there where, where Danny had been. Great tornado coming. And they all look up and wonder at it. And then from the soundtrack comes Grace Slick, the great singer for the Jefferson Airplane. And she's intoning those words. You better find somebody to love. You've, you've got to find somebody to love. Well, clearly this is the Cohen's version of the voice of God coming out of the whirlwind. Job has listened to his three friends. He finds them unsatisfactory. He then turns to God and he calls him into the dock and he says, what are you doing? Tell me the truth. And then out of the desert whirlwind comes the voice of God. So in the Cohen's version, that's it. The word from the whirlwind is, you better find somebody to love. Well, here's what struck me now as I thought about the movie. The three things he hears I'm, I'm struggling, the world has fallen on top of me, what's God doing? The three things he hears are all important, I think. The young rabbi, this kind of superficial, we think, you know, trite uh, advice, is actually in his own way pretty profound. Yes, it's true that God is in all things, and we need to change our eyes to see it, even in something as simple as a parking lot. There's God. And that is a great bit of biblical wisdom. The Bible holds that, that God is in all things. Learn how to see Him. Secondly, the story about the, uh, the teeth and the Hebrew letters. Yeah, not typically, but sometimes, occasionally, God speaks in these remarkable ways. So the biblical narrative is um, characterized by these, re these remarkable revelations of God, these miraculous manifestations. Rare, yes indeed, not God's typical way of communicating, but... Sometimes he does. And then the final answer, both from the mouth of the aged rabbi and from the whirlwind, you better find somebody to love. That's not a bad answer. If God is love, then the best way to participate in God, to communicate with God, even during times of great crisis, is to find somebody to love, to get out of your own um, self-absorption and to participate in that which God is. So I thought, as the movie came to a close and I reflected on those, on those three um, insights, I thought, not bad advice from the Rabbi's Cohen.